generation of young men. A war that brought with it huge advancements in technology, technology that would aid in the killing of many. Many men would lose their lives in this contest over borders, men from faraway places involved in an international contest that had little to do with their everyday lives. Why would someone from as far away as Canada want to risk their life in such a war? What drove men to commit themselves to this cause? The answer to that question remains elusive, as there are many factors contributing to the decisions of these individuals. To better understand the numerous pressures encouraging Canadian men to risk their lives, one can turn to examining the recruitment process used during the Great War. One of the most visible components of the recruitment process, to both the modern historian and contemporary Canadian citizen, were the various posters organized to persuade men to enlist. These posters, primarily targeted to the men they hoped to persuade, used a variety of tactics in their attempts, drawing on both British and original designs. One successful early strategy evoked patriotism as a way to sway many British-born Canadians to return and defend their country of origin. As Canada was still considered a vital part of the wider Commonwealth, this strategy had limited success with Canadian-born citizens as well, as education that championed British imperialism and family ties to Britain encouraged a strong endorsement of patriotic notions. As the war began to demand even more men, recruitment officers began to apply pressures other than patriotic duty to convince men to enlist. It was easy for recruiting officers to appeal to Canadians and to convince them to go overseas uh, by telling them that it was their masculine duty to do so uh, and uh, by implying kind of implicitly uh, that not joining up uh, would mean uh, that they weren't doing their duty as men. Camaraderie amongst men is one of the more interesting paths recruitment material took, as this notion was used in several distinct ways, including camaraderie based on ethnic background, on athletics, on sports fan culture, and even more generally on belonging to a national community. Using notions of masculine identity based on an ability to financially provide for one's family proved easy to implement, as posters reminded men that the government provided pensions and the civilian initialized patriotic fund provided financial stability to the families of soldiers, appealing to masculine ideals centered upon a protector image. There were numerous posters circulated that asked men to protect a feminized country or simply asked them to protect their families in Canada by fighting overseas. While these broader campaigns certainly held men to standardized notions of masculinity as a way of persuading men to enlist by conforming, it was the localized nature of recruitment that held much of the persuasive power. Recruiting in the First World War is very much locally based, and what that means is that uh, it was local militia units uh, and regiments that were largely in charge of actually organizing men to go overseas. At the local level, this meant putting up posters, it meant uh, going out into public spaces and trying to convince young Canadians to go to war. Um, the difference between a national recruiting effort and a local recruiting effort uh, was that there was also an attempt to try and attach civic pride, town pride, city pride uh, to the success of those recruiting drives. So you see various towns in southwestern Ontario as an example measuring the num measuring their own patriotism by the number of men that they're able to muster to go to war. And so as a result, there's a competition that erupts between various communities. London's got this many, how about Chatham over here? Well, what about Guelph? They've done this. Uh, and the result then is this competition between communities. And that helps to both, I think, um, put a finer point on recruiting in those local communities because there's this the sense that somehow your patriotism is going to be diminished, that your town's sense of masculinity will be diminished if you can't bring enough men to the colors. Uh, and that also then means sometimes you have to resort to uh, shaming uh, as well as other tactics to convince people uh, that they need to join up. And you can imagine in a small town where everybody knows each other, and even in a city um, the size of Waterloo or, or Guelph at the time, these are smallish places where everybody at least had some sense of who everybody else was. And you could kind of play on the fact that, well, your brother went or your brother's got a bad arm, he can't go, so you should go. Uh, which made recruiting very personal as well as very local. As indicated by Dr. Humphreys, the localized nature of these campaigns ensured an additional pressure on men to successfully bolster the image of their community. This localization also provided recruiters with intimate knowledge of the community and relations within it leaving a reluctance to enlist to become a very personal dilemma. While the community at large added to the pressures faced by young men, another formidable factor in coaxing young men to join the war effort lied in the women of Canada. The poster campaigns of 
the Great War took a direct route in appealing to women. Posters persuaded mothers, wives, and girlfriends to simply say go, enforcing notions of men's masculine duty in war as being upheld by women's feminine supporting role. There's different opinions on the role that women played in the recruiting process. Some historians argue that women played a very subtle role in the background, uh, kind of pushing and prodding men to go by uh, uh, trying to convince them uh, that it was their duty, by reminding them uh, that it was important uh, that they uh, do their duty to their country, uh, to their family, and that they uh, try and uh, um, maintain, I guess, their uh, social status by, uh, by joining the Canadian Expeditionary Force. There are other views, though, that suggest that uh, women played a more overt role. The White Feather campaign is probably uh, one of the more famous uh, versions of that um, uh, idea. Uh, for a long time, I think historians argued that that was a myth, um, that or that it wasn't a very prevalent thing. Uh, I think we've kind of come back to a, a middle ground approach now, where historians would argue uh, that women played both overt and kind of covert roles in convincing uh, men to go to war, both by kind of subtly convincing them to go uh, to war because it was important to the country and to their families, uh, as well as by directly appealing to their sense of masculinity uh, by trying to convince men uh, that it was important uh, for them to go to war uh, through handing out white feathers, that sort of thing. The combination of these various pressures within society, expecting men to enlist and join the military effort of the Great War, certainly proved effective in gathering recruits for the war. As the war raged on, though, less and less men were willing to volunteer for such a dangerous effort. Ultimately, the voluntary nature of Canada's traditional military structure would give way, after considerable controversy, to conscription. Men were no longer pressured from all sections of the community to go to war. They were simply forced. Even in this light, one should not forget the precarious situation faced by men during the volunteer days of the Great War. Tasked with the difficult decision of facing death in the foreign trenches of battle, or facing shame on the home front, many men would succumb to the pressures exerted by the recruitment campaigns in the community at large, losing their lives in a faraway war.